extremely, extremely excited to see what is happening here and everything uh, that you, Diana, have realized with your team. I know how much work that was, and uh, I congratulate you from my heart. Um, so art initiatives of the center, um, obviously bringing together my practitioners from various parts of the Asian realm, um, you know, except me, who is from Europe and um, probably the least knowledgeable about that particular um, context and geography. And so what we have decided, just in terms of the format, is that we will give every participant um, about eight minutes to introduce their activities, their initiatives, um, so we all get a better idea of what exactly they are doing and what exactly is happening. Uh, <laughs> I'm handing over some models. Um, but before we do that, maybe just a, a few remarks um, to sort of set um, or to, to, to sort of bracket this very wide context. And the remarks I would like to make obviously come from the brief we have received, and that was brilliantly put together by Diana, um, which is off-center. You know, what is off-center? Obviously, we are um, talking about issues of geography and place and site. So where there's an off-center, there's a center, there's a periphery, there's sort of issues of marginality. So what do these terms mean? What do they mean today? What do they mean to you particularly? Um, there's this... Um, maybe nice um, uh, wording that James Clifford used, and he calls it between localism and worldliness. You know? So how do you sort of navigate these two um, concepts of localism and worldliness in your particular practice? But obviously, as we all know, geographic denominations are not neutral, and they're very tricky, because under them, lies a whole layering, not only of political and social and cultural issues, but you know, the geographic very often tends to be um, politicized or geopoliticized. So the geographic, the writing of the earth is not just a writing, but it's also an inscribing. It's also sort of picking up um, murky and dif difficult narratives that we maybe will look at um, for a brief moment. So there's this whole idea of a certain shattered speciality uh, in all these ideas and concepts. Um, and maybe so what we can do, what I suggest we could do, is maybe also challenging a bit this orthodoxy of the space and of spatial narratives, or actually examining in what ways they're useful in what ways they have changed over the years of our practices, and I definitely think they have. Um, I think maybe just one image I want to bring up, which we have all experienced, um, is this idea of the artist as the sort of informed, embedded agent that comes to a place or, or lives in a certain sp space and has a sort of privileged position to recognize certain issues and then actually either symbolically or narratively or, or in a documentary manner, sort of is able to represent and bring them out. I think that image has faded from sort of a collective um, consciousness and has again been more complicated in its narration. I think place and context um, are sort of terminologies that have started to um, bring up this layering that I was mentioning before. But um, maybe just a, a, a last um, idea that I would like to suggest um, is, how can I say, when we talk about place today, in my mind or in my thinking, it is also maybe a way to defictionalize certain narratives. I think to me that is a very important moment. And what I mean by defictionalizing is not uh, taking away the poetics, not taking away the aesthetic possibilities, 
but maybe in a world where mediascapes, where mainstream cinema has created very specific um, images of places, maybe sort of within artistic practices and collective practices, um, you know, place does matter after all, and does matter greatly, um, because the need to sort of bring back the sort of non-fictual or the factual in a certain way is uh, certain, certainly something we feel um, is very urgently needed as a corrective. So maybe I will leave my introductory notes uh, at that. Um, it is sort of a cloud of, of, of ideas that I would bring to the table. But then very practically, you know, how do we actually go about things? So maybe we start with Shamini. Would you like to take uh, the microphone? And absolutely, for two seconds. The Book Project is called The Incomplete Tomo. The subject matter of Tomo um, was that it explored the displacement of Tamil speaking people from the north of Sri Lanka during the war. I'll just say that much about it. But I'm going to introduce it by speaking the words or quoting from something that the Sri Lankan writer Michael Ondaatje said. Quote, the book startlingly begins with an almost unrecognizable map of Sri Lanka until you realize it is upside down with place names and towns printed the right way up. So Point Pedro and Kodakaman are at natural eye level while the southern part of the island where the power and the narrative voice usually reside are now somewhere to the distant north. In fact, not even on the map. It's off stage. The furthest north or south we get is Vavonia. End of quote. The Sri Lanka Archive of Contemporary Art, Architecture and Design is based in Jaffna, which according to this map is situated in a part of the country that sits upturned. A part, of that a part of the country that was tipped upside down, if you like, turned over by 30 years of civil conflict, emptied, if you think how a map might act as a vessel, emptied of its people, emptied of its homes, emptied of its objects, emptied of its stories, emptied of its landscapes, and so on and so forth. I set up the archive with T. Shinathanan, who's the artist book project I've just shown you, and another colleague of ours, um, of many years, P. Hyelan. And all three of us are art historians, and we've written and we've published and spoken about Sri Lankan contemporary art for a great many years. However, this was not the motivation behind setting up the archive. No, the motivation was something that came from somewhere completely different. Or was it? It came from wanting to establish a resource that the three of us never had. The idea, in fact, though, to make this possible, as it were, as a kind of catalyst, was in 2012, when Raking Leaves was asked by, or asked to host, the Mobile Library Project, um, which is an ongoing initiative of the internationally recognized Asia Art Archive, based in Hong Kong, which is a project which addresses the needs, um, to, their need to bring their collection to more people. Um, and they launched the Mobile Library Project, which brings approximately, I believe, 400 items from their collection to different cities in Asia. So in hosting this project, um, I then put the idea of setting up an archive to Shinathanan and Ihelen, who were both very immediately committed and supportive to the idea. But when I said, you should donate all your books in your personal libraries, who sort of looked at me sort of strangely. But this is actually what we each did. Um, and soon, as the Mobile Library Project finished, which is here, yeah, so this is the Mobile Library Project, just at a couple of slides here, but when the Mobile Library Project, of course, eventually went back, returned to Hong Kong, the question of where to house this archive, this, this the Sri Lankan one, um, that we had established, um, of course, arose. Um, next slide. Um, and I suppose like um, those sort of 
it's really those kind of great dear diary moments. Um, we were offered this rather beautiful house here, which is an old Jaffna courtyard house um, that was recently restored by the architect Andre Lendron. And it's owned by the Kumaraswamy family, who no longer live in Jaffna, no longer have a need for the house. They restored it. Um, it was never damaged um, during the conflict. Um, and they wanted to put the house to some kind of use. Um, they wanted to see it being used for some kind of public benefit. Next slide. So the archive is now in its second year. Um, it's dedicated to collecting materials in English, Sinhala, and Tamil related to the development of contemporary art and architecture and design in Sri Lanka. We're a, a reading room, um, we're not a borrowing library, and we're open um, Monday, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday from 10 till 6. Um, to date, we've collected, um, it's just over 2,000 materials, um, most of which have all been donated, and that includes exhibition catalogues, journals, invitation cards, posters, that, that kind of ephemera, uh, books, including press cuttings as well, um, as I say, in all three languages. Um, next, next slide, please. And one aspect of being located in this house is its courtyard. Um, traditionally, this is a place um, where people of the household would congregate and meet, and, and it's precisely that function that we, we are using it for. So it's a space where we host our talks program, which we hold every two weeks. Next slide, please. I think our younger speaker is 25 and our oldest has been 78. Um, and in the first two years, um, we've hosted 37 events, we've screened 56 films, held talks by 40 artists, filmmakers, film theorists, art historians, designers, anthropologists, architects, conservators, fashion designers, performance artists, graphic designers, and curators. And all of the talks um, reflect on the contents of the archive and sometimes when we don't have any content, we use the talk to generate the discussion around the content that we know we need to try and establish. So we've recently been putting a big uh, emphasis on uh, short films, for example, to get the debate going. To give, you some of you, to give you some idea of size, we have one senior librarian, she has one assistant librarian, and then we work with a roster of volunteers who include our translators. So every talk is translated. The library is mainly used by students, and we have a way tracked an audience of approximately 85 people on average to our fortnightly talks. Now, being outside of the capital, that is Colombo, has its advantages and its disadvantages, um, and it's obviously not something I'm going to focus on here. But one of the things I think I want to highlight about the archive is the audience who come to use it to attend the talks, especially. Because in the beginning, when we would hold a talk, there would always be a discussion to follow it. Um, but the discussion initially meant listening to the speaker, followed by five minutes of silence after the talk and when the discussion moved to the audience. So everyone was either too shy. So people, people were too shy um, or unsure of asking a question because just to, to give some context here, I, I suppose some people in the audience will understand this. In South Asia, the idea of discussion is either throwing insults or sitting silent. Um, the teacher or the lecturer is somebody who is seen as a figure of authority. Um, sometimes to, the, to ask a question is perceived as a challenge of, to that authority. And, and, and quite often the reverence that one gives to a, a, a senior person is also part of this. So I'm really pleased to say that with the, with the archive, we've managed to watch the discussion time um, grow from five minutes to now one hour where we have to stop them and, and say, that's it. Um, and while this intellectual curiosity of our audience, if I, you know, for want of a better word of describing it, provides much to celebrate, it's also the challenge that we face in that it gives us something to contend with when we think about how do we keep, uh, how do we sustain that level of engagement develop it, um, and, and, and where do we put that to use, if you like, in the place where we are with them? Next, uh, not the, sorry, the last slide. I, I began with a map, and I, I want to close with this one, where I'd say one thing that the archive does is it puts Sri Lanka at the center of a project that involves recovering, recording, and in time, I hope, making sense of a history of its visual culture, a history that had times 
has been contested and at other times perhaps negated. Um, but if the archive can help to support correctives and changes to the dominant narratives of Sri Lankan art history in the light of new, perhaps omitted, overlooked histories, it will put Sri Lanka at the center of her own world rather than at the periphery of someone else's. Thank you. The Tentative Collective is a gathering of artists, curators, educators, architects, and in the past, collaborators from completely different backgrounds, including fishermen, housewives, and domestic workers. We are based in Karachi, and uh, while we work site-specifically in response to the cities we inhabit, we are interested in engaging with the specificities and commonalities of modernity in rapidly growing cities of the Global South. In particular, the precarious urban geographies of such cities and the voids they open for groups like ours to inhabit. This city of mine is a whore with whom every eligible male descending from the mountains or emerging from the plains with wallets of different sizes spends the night. In the morning, slapping her on one cheek, he expects the other one and leaves for work drunk in anticipation of the night to come. In 1968, Tofi Krafat writes a poem about Karachi, the city sandwiched between the desert and the sea as it swells by reclamation. In a moment of nostalgia, perhaps, he asks, where did my city go? We respond, how do we untrain our eyes to see it, to see beyond the persistent colonization of the present by this nostalgic mode? We are observers. In Mera Karachi Mobile Cinema, of the slides you just saw before these, we try to create a poetic archive of everyday spaces of leisure in the city. We use vernacular media, intuition, and informal conversation to build this archive. Cell phone videos, instead of high aesthetic form, cheap, blurry, low-res images. They fill our memory cards and are translated into ephemeral projections on ships, on trains, colonial heritage sites, boundaries, concrete walls, corrugated steel, wood, and plastic. We let the city be our guide. We nurture friendships with strangers. We work very, very slowly, over three years. We are facilitators. In projections, we ask, how can we momentarily inhabit each other's imagination, each other's city? We create a rhythm of ephemeral projections in public space, inserting luminous imagery events, sound, and light in the architecture of the city. We contextualize urban transference, desires, memories, political interventions, and engagements with transient publics. In Gandhi Engine Commission, we are storytellers, drawing from the river its memories and archives of development and destruction, sewage, waste, and toxicity from pre-colonial histories to the neo-colonial present. We pause to resonate with this sentient ecology and examine our relationship as urban dwellers to its death. We are collectors. We binge on popular culture, notes on the wall, quotes on a rickshaw, images of the disappeared, oral histories of the emigrated, fragments of celebration, overheard sentences, conversations with strangers. An image burns itself in my subconscious a landslide of construction debris submerging apartments in Shenzhen. A sea of cranes dig, dig through this dystopic landfill of modernity. We look at our sea. It seems to be disappearing behind walls. We look at our land stolen from the sea, its sprouts, cul-de-sacs, and gated communities. We gather maps and measurements and etymologies of categories made by experts from other continents. We gather brochures of apartment complexes and ads of worlding developments, evidence of urban transformation, inventories of waste. In 1968, Tofi Krafat posed a question, where did my city go? We respond, we are the city. We are artists, we are cynics, we are facilitators. We make, we collect, we observe, we walk, we listen to what exists and how it is changing. We shape shift. We are tentative. Um, and on the desk uh, over there, on the, the, the stage over there, are some books of uh, 
trash that we have collected. Please help yourself to some. Thank you. So I just uh, maybe just I'd start with uh, telling you a little bit about Designer Machine Collective. So um, 2004, my partner and I shifted to uh, the Northeast. We are both from the Northeast of India, which is actually the triangular part uh, you know, of uh, India, which you see right in the East. And um, I was born in Shillong, and my partner was born in uh, you know, Assam. And um, you know, we were studying outside, we came back, and uh, at some point, uh, you know, we decided that we wanted to work together. And uh, being from there, we you know, started working from that context. And uh, it slowly just emerged that we, the context was so you know, interesting. But at the same time, there was so much you know, conflict there. Even at that time in 2004, there was uh, you know, so the history of the place is uh, a huge number of insurgencies and counter-insurgency movements. And uh, because of that, there was no public space. There was no art space. There was, uh, you know no public opinion at all and uh, you know so we were kind of uh, caught in this kind of uh, space where we wanted to work there but we found it extremely suffocating as well and uh, if you look at the you know geography of uh, the northeast it's uh, got 99% borders which are international and uh, that small part with which you know it's connected to it's uh, connected to the rest of india is uh, called the chicken neck and it's just 20 kilometers so it's landlocked and, uh, you know, that kind of makes for this very interesting uh, geographical space. There is a lot of, uh, you know, different ethnic groups there, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, obviously there is a lot of movement, but it's still kind of really blocked and you can, you know, kind of feel it in that space. Then, um, yeah, so when we decided that we wanted to kind of create an art space, next slide please, we came across, you know, the most uh, magnificent river that is there in that region, the Brahmaputra. And uh, we realized that the Brahmaputra actually creates a very interesting, um, you know, kind of juxtaposition because it uh, breaks the flow, you know, it kind of disrupts the landlockedness of the place and uh, creates the space for, you know, flow. It's, it's, it's a massive river, it's uh, 2,900 kilometers in length, it starts from Tibet, it flows through India into Bangladesh and into the Bay of Bengal. It's called different names, you know, throughout. And uh, we decided that, uh, you know, maybe working with the river would be an interesting thing. And, you know, uh, the history of uh, the river transport in that region was huge because uh, obviously the uh, British had established these steamers which carried a lot of uh, goods to and fro. And uh, there were a number of these steamers which were now lying redundant because, uh, you know, road transport had taken over. And um, we saw a number of these ships just lying there. Some of them were used, uh, you know, just to ferry people across. But even that had uh, reduced a lot because there was a bridge which had come across uh, the river and uh, in Gohati. And um, we kind of started looking at these spaces and started looking at what was happening with these uh, ferries which were just lying there and uh, we kind of, uh, you know, so this is what the landscape looks like on the river. There are a number of these ferries in different sizes and uh, we were a little bit cheeky and we just kind of, you know, looked at the best, biggest ferry and kind of, you know, set our hearts on it. We were like, okay, this is what we want for our art space. And uh, miraculously it happened. So this ferry was called uh, MV Chandradinga. It was made in 1978. And it's actually traveled to Bangladesh numerous times. And uh, this ferry, uh, you know, we were able to get because, uh, you know, it was just sheer luck because the minister at that time, uh, you know, we were able to get in touch with him and he kind of uh, uh, supported the project. He supported the idea. And uh, so we were able to almost squat in that space because people knew that we had his, you know, blessings. So we kind of uh, started using that space. and. Uh, Initially, we had a lot of uh, problems because uh, the government owns these ferries and there were a lot of people who, you know, kind of manned them. And they were completely, you know, uh, feeling threatened because they saw a bunch of these very urban-looking people coming and doing strange things. And they were like, you know, what the hell is going on? And slowly, you know, it took many years, but we built a rapper with them. They would be part of our openings. We would cook food with them. And they become, became our audience. They became the biggest supporters of the project. And uh, where this ferry is, is also very interesting because it's uh, docked in Gohati. 
and uh, Guwahati is actually divided into um, North and South Guwahati. South Guwahati is, uh, you know, the urban center, which you see in these pictures. And on the other side, what you see is North Guwahati, which is uh, actually the rural part. So we also looked at the space as, you know, liminal. And uh, yeah, so that way it became also, you know, the space which is in between water and land. It's in between the river, you know, and um, also, Urban and uh, rural connect was very interesting for this. And also, of course, uh, you know, the idea of heterotopias that Foucault talks about was also, you know, part of the thinking for this space. Next slide. Yeah, so this is what, you know, the ferry looks like. And um, we had, we've had, uh, you know, so uh, we didn't actually construct anything on it. We just left it the way it is. And it actually uh, lended itself to various kind of programming. So we've had talks there, we've had uh, conferences, we've had film screenings, residencies, people have lived there, they've cooked food, and uh, various other things. So in that sense, it's again really you know, open-ended. And uh, also what happens with a space like this is, since it's not a white cube, the kind of audience that actually feel comfortable in coming in is, uh, you know, it's amazing for us. So we had this uh, theater performance once, and uh, there was some construction going on on the roadside, and we had this huge number of, you know, uh, labor who were living there come into the space because we had a folk singer singing, and uh, they came into the space, and it was totally jam-packed. And uh, you know, suddenly, you know, we have like about you know, 200 people come and we were like, you know, what's going on here? And then suddenly after the performance finished, we realized that this folk singer was really famous on radio. Even though we didn't know her, all these people knew her really well and they were, you know, completely, they were really grateful to have this performance and, you know, so that way it becomes really interesting as well because the space is totally, you know, it can be changed the way you want it to. Next slide. Yeah, so this uh, space, when we envisioned it, we already had in mind that it's not going to be an, just an art space because you know we were we have a number of interests. So we envisioned it as a hybrid space for cross-disciplinary practices, as a network space, also you know a public space where uh, you know a lot of things which couldn't happen in other spaces could happen here. And uh, we were looking at you know things as diverse as technology, art, ecology, media, science, everything. And I'd just like to you know, talk a little bit about this project. This is a food spiral that uh, this Belgian artist called Bartku has made. And uh, he was looking at you know, the idea of using local ma materials, bamboo, but also maximizing the utilization of space. And what he did is he created this uh, bamboo spiral. And he created a water filter as well in this. And he just left it without you know, actually putting any seeds or anything, and the seeds you know, which were already there or came in with birds and flu, actually, you know, resulted in this a few months later. And he also created a water purifying plant. So it was just, you know, he was interested in the poetics of it. He had... Uh... Okay, yeah. So the next slide, please, yeah. So this is another project that he did with solar power, edible so solar power cells. And uh, again, this was more uh, about the poetics of creating solar power because he created it with, you know, fruits and vegetables. So, and he just demonstrated how solar power can be created. Yeah, next. This is a project where we looked at, uh, this is called Bhadwati Tales, and it looked at, uh, you know, micro histories. And uh, so two questions we were putting up to the boatmen here, and uh, one was where does the river start? And most of them just, you know, normally told us that it started in where the river enters Assam. And the other was, you know, what is the most extraordinary thing that you've seen with the river? And they were like, you know, a lot of people come here to commit suicide, it's, and it's normally lovers. So they had all these really interesting stories to tell us. The next slide. So, and we've done a lot of uh, mapping. So the one that you see on top is actually a GPS map of uh, crossings, and uh, these uh, crossings are from the north to the south, and uh, these, you know, so what happens is the level of the water changes throughout the year, and, uh, you know, different maps get created, you know, so it, it'll be a different line for each month. And the second one is actually a map from, uh, this is a hand-drawn map, 
that the captain we found from the captain and a lot of it actually comes into bangladesh so this is a channel of the river which actually enters bangladesh and they they've used it to navigate into bangladesh many times so i'd like to just end with the this quotation that no man ever steps in the same river twice for it is not the same river and he is not the same man by heraclitus thank you for quite some time as to how to talk about 10 years in 8 minutes i have no images but i'll try and kind of flag a few things um just a few facts um, i'm here i think in a sense we are talking about case studies in a certain way of certain kinds of interventions and uh, i'm always so full of doubt about everything you know, about that i do that it's uh, but it's hard for me to describe anything uh, you know very precisely but it's hard for me to describe anything uh, you know very precisely but factually we are talking about about an installation and an exhibition that i did with some friends of mine which is called the sovereign forest which is a kind of a uh, constellation of films books texts seeds objects um it's an exhibition installation that uh, travels uh, in different cities but is also housed Uh, permanently and open to public in the city of Bhubaneswar, which is the capital of the state of Odisha in eastern India, and um, it's been open to public there uh, for now, um, I think four years uh, continuously, and uh, in collaboration with a, uh, a group of friends, activists who are political activists, journalists, researchers, filmmakers. Uh, in a group called samadhi uh factually that's in a kind of a brief description of of say supposedly of the center uh, in in a way uh however i just thought i'm not showing any images of this exhibition or the installation for 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 us it's it's a big thing to have survived four years as just one exhibition uh and it grows and we keep adding things to it uh but i thought that in the context of specificities of where we are and how we are working and how do we intervene maybe if i just flag a few things that kind of concern me about this whole exercise of going somewhere or doing something or setting up something and um i started working in this area as making films way back in the mid late 90s and one of the things that kind of always um um uh, i would come back with is that it that it's too complicated every social political process that was taking place individual relationships uh, state central relationships the movement of corporations the institutions that were moving in that area the appropriation of land the dispossession mining i mean the whole process was so severe so rapid so severe that it was quite hard to understand um i remember at that time um uh, you know if you if you made a map of say mining areas if you made a map of forest areas and if you made a map of cultural funding uh or you would find that there was this, you know you would think that a lot of cultural funding would be going to say bombay delhi or the big places but actually you would find a fair amount of cultural spending taking place in places that you don't know i mean these maps would overlap uh, so whether you're looking at uh, european funding not just i'm not talking about indian governmental funding but you could see at that time uh, a cross section of international and corporate cultural funding uh, which overlapped very well with business interests with uh, mining maps with forest maps with indigenous community maps and so on so essentially why i'm saying that is that it's very hard I, i i do not know how to move how do you move into this you know how do you decide what kind of space are you going to make or uh, who is the space going to be for and um, and so on and so forth so the the work, the work that i did essentially is about when i started to think that perhaps you know making is i, I can't even say that i decided to make a space uh what i could say is that i think it seemed more interesting to think about space or 
institutions as processes, that would it be possible to actually initiate a set of activities that there's a certain kind of, even if it's a set of inquiries, but there's a certain consistency to these activities and a certain consistency to these interventions, if you were to call them, whether they are about making films, whether they are about teaching films, whether they are about setting up schools, whether it's about intervening in news or poetry or film and so on. But if done consistently, would it be possible actually to form spaces, since we are talking about spaces, that become institutions that can move, can be camouflaged, can come up, can appear, can disappear, can be fragile. It doesn't matter if it collapses in six months, eight months, because these territories are really fragile and complex. You could be pulled down in a day. Uh, the friends that I work with don't uh, take any funding. So you can't, you can't set up a space and set up an installation and set up an exhibition and then apply for a grant because not only wouldn't they, they would stop working with you, but everybody else will stop working with them as well because of the politics of the grant and the objective of the grant and the intentions of the grant. So there's, there's, so in, in a sense, all this fills you with complete doubt. How do you move forward? And so the sovereign forest, in a sense, as an installation, became like a long process of over eight, nine years, really, of consultations. Shall we set up a school? But we don't have a building, but let's set up a school. So then we start setting up a school. Shall we set up a film festival? But we don't have money, but maybe we can get 20, 30 films. Shall we set up a... Um, uh, you know, an art space, but we don't have a building. Uh, but let's start collecting what could be in it and so on and so forth. And I, I think I'm at the end of my time, if it's, uh, you know, followed correctly. So, uh, so I, I would probably say somewhere down the line, I was able to formulate a very simple kind of proposition uh, wherein the, the artwork itself is a proposition. Uh, in the sense that since we are talking about center and periphery and, you know, my friends think they are the center, so I don't know where we, are, you know, what is center and what is periphery really. But uh, if you look at the law, the law of the land is, cent is, 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 is authoritative and central and we all follow it. But if one were to actually see that perhaps maybe, uh, you know, the definition of a crime which is defined by law of the land itself, suppose that definition itself is incorrect of what a crime is, or suppose the definition of evidence itself is incorrect, of how do you an analyze and understand and conclude about a crime. Suppose one were to put a proposition that is it possible to have poetry as evidence formally in a criminal trial. All these questions, essentially what it led to was that is this just a metaphoric question or can we actually make this real? So can I, if you bring your forensic evidence of a crime and if I bring poetry as evidence of the same crime, if we put it side by side, what would you comprehend about the same crime? So in order to not, for this not to be a metaphoric question, we actually put the poetic, put poetry as evidence formally up front. When you put it up front, you find that what do you do with this poetry? What do you do with the, what you've collected? What do you do with the films you've made? What do you do with the photographs you've collected? Where do you take it? And it seems valuable, but then somehow you have to keep it somewhere. And the moment you keep it somewhere, you, perhaps you've got a space. And perhaps people will start visiting it and so on and so forth. So that's the best way I could describe this space, where we, we are not exactly sure what it is. Uh, and sometimes it feels like a school and sometimes it feels like an exhibition and sometimes it feels like a meeting place. But we have been on for, for four months, four years, and have got quite a cross-section, you know, from policemen to students to farmers uh, to, to a range of people. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, uh, I'll just uh, give you a brief uh, background on... Uh, my partner Ritu and my uh, kind of filmmaking practice, which I think is relevant to how we started the Dharamsala International Film Festival, 
which Ritu will talk more about. So uh, we are an uh, Indian Tibetan filmmaking team. We've been making films for nearly 30 years now. We started out as filmmakers, uh, as students in the San Francisco Bay Area, moved to London for almost 10 years, uh, establishing, establishing ourselves as independent filmmakers. And when we started out uh, making films, what we realized was, uh, you know, being a Tibetan, what we realized was uh, there were no Tibetan filmmakers at the time. And most of the films that were being made about Tibet were being made uh, by uh, non-Tibetans, mostly uh, in the West. And these films, although well-meaning, tended to kind of exoticize the subject or reduce it to very simplistic sort of black and whites, you know. So we felt it was really important to counter this and tell our own stories from, from uh, within the community. And uh, that is what we did, and that's what we've been doing for pretty much the last 30 years, uh, making films mostly on Tibetan subjects that uh, talk, uh, you know, that deal with a range of subjects from uh, history, politics, uh, you know, identity, but all from a very personal perspective. Uh, in 1996, uh, after living uh, abroad in, you know, large metropolitan areas for almost 20 years, we decided to move back uh, to India. Primarily, I think, uh, the, one of the impulses was we wanted to be closer to the community that we were making films about. And uh, naturally, Dharamsala being uh, the home of the Dalai Lama, and the headquarters of the Tibetan government in exile, and in some ways the center of the Tibetan diaspora uh, was kind of quite a obvious choice to move back to. Um, Ritu also had a kind of a personal connection with Dharamsala because her family were, uh, you know, was originally from Dharamsala. So we moved back to Dharamsala, and uh, over the years that we lived there, we also began to engage more with uh, the local communities, particularly the Gaddi tribal people who are the original inhabitants of uh, Dharamsala, and we ended up making films about them as well. What we realized when we moved back to Dharamsala was that, uh, one, it was that the Tibetan refugee community in Dharamsala, which forms a sizable you know, uh, part of the population, was a very insular and kind of self-contained community, had very little interaction, any meaningful interaction with the larger Indian kind of community outside it. Outside it. Uh, Naturally, I mean, as a refugee community, I guess it, you know, that's quite uh, understandable. Secondly, uh, we realized that there was a real dearth of uh, any kind of contemporary, you know, film or art uh, kind of activity. And uh, that was also something that uh, we felt, you know, a, a very cosmopolitan place like Dharamsala could uh, actually use. So given our very kind of special position as an Indian Tibetan couple, which is still very, uh, unique in the Tibetan community, uh, and the fact that we were filmmakers who had lived abroad for a long time, we felt like we could do something to both offer a platform and a space to try and bridge the, the different communities that live in Dharamsala, and to somehow expose them to contemporary film, contemporary art. So we, in 2012, we started a, a trust, White Crane Arts and Media, with the main aim of uh, promoting uh, contemporary art, cinema, independent media practices, specifically in the Himalayan regions of India, because that's where we felt uh, we could be most useful. And uh, being filmmakers, having been to many film festivals around the world, we decided that a film festival was something that we could you know, start with, uh, that we could handle. So in 2012, we uh, started the first Dharamsala International Film Festival, and uh, it's had a very good run. This year we had, or last year we had the fourth edition, and uh, you know it's uh, it, it's kind of become established. So I'll let Ritu tell you more about the festival. Thank you. Four minutes uh, to tell you about the festival. I think one of the things I should mention is we were thinking about getting a space, uh, but we were scared about a space, who would take care of the space, how would it function, how would we get funding. And so as filmmakers who are so used to projects, the idea of a finite project, uh, a, a festival appealed to us that we had like an event, you know, four days, uh, we work towards this event and once it's over, we can go back to our own work as filmmakers. That was kind of the dream. Um, but we did realize it was going to be quite hard to achieve, so we thought three years we'll take off from our own 
personal filmmaking work and we'll focus on the festival and then we can you know go back to our own work yeah. as filmmakers um, the festivals had many challenges uh, firstly we live in a small town um, it's a rural community for the most part um, it's 10 hours from delhi and uh, there is no cinema there so when we were starting a festival, people were like, what are you doing? There's, where are you going to show these films? So we basically take up two spaces, uh, two auditoriums, and we really bring equipment in from outside and set up a festival. And it started smaller, but now we have about 5,000 people attending the festival. We have you know, about 40 films every year. We try to bring all the filmmakers over. So over the years, we have, you know, every year we have at least 50 guests from all over the world. And we program the film festival ourselves because we didn't want it to be like a, a format that was pre-decided. We thought the best thing was, we know the audience, we know the people who are living here, we know the kind of films that would interest them. And so often the films are about issues of, you know, exile or human rights and politics, but of course always, you know, films that we really care about and we think uh, are important and will raise discussions. I think people can talk to filmmakers afterwards and um, you know discuss the subjects. Um, yeah, um, I think the other important part for us is outreach. How do we get people who have no exposure to cinema to come and watch films? And that has been really difficult. Uh, and every year we invite um, young people, colleges, uh, students, uh, Indians and Tibetans to the festival and get them to see films and have discussions. And I think, in a sense, it's been easier for us to grow the festival around India. We get film people who love films from all over India coming, especially for the festival every year. But it's really hard to engage the community because they have no exposure, they have no education, they only have watched, uh, they've only watched television, they've never even seen a film in the cinema because there's no cinema in this town. So that is one of the most difficult things. And I think slowly it's changing. You know, slowly we are able to move things. But I think this is something that will probably need 10 years. You know, it'll take 10 years before we start having filmmakers come out of these communities. Uh, we did start a, a film fellows program two years ago, where we to select five filmmakers from the Himalayan regions. And we bring them to the festival. And they have one-to-one -one sessions, mentorship sessions with filmmakers. And uh, that has been quite interesting, and I think by doing that, we can really, again, nurture uh, local filmmakers from the Himalayan regions. Mm. And then I think uh, um, the other thing that I think kind of the interesting moments have been things like, you know, we show a film about, uh, there was a wonderful film called Fondry, which was about a Maharashtrian film about caste issues, a fiction film. Uh, the filmmaker came. When the local audiences saw it, they suddenly could really relate to it because caste is there all over India. And they were like uh, asking the filmmaker, why we, have you never seen a film like this? Why does nobody talk about these issues? So we have films there that we feel people can relate to. You know, it brings it back to their own lives. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I think the challenges, I, I should say as a filmmaker, it's been very challenging personally because we haven't found space to do our own work and we're slowly hoping to find ways of doing our own work and continuing the festival. And that's always like a, a real conflict for us. Uh, we have also partnered with Koj. Uh, first year we had an artist residency. We showed films from the TBA's collection of uh, uh, you know, filmmakers, uh, artists, films. We have shown films of Harun Faruqi. We are doing more and more. We showed, we did some soundscapes. So every year we try to change what we are watching. We try to bring new formats, things that are more challenging to, for our audiences. And the audiences are receptive. That's what we are really amazed. So every year we try something new and we find that it's working well. Thank you. I believe that crack is an experience. If we've never been there, it is very difficult to understand what we're doing, actually, the last 10 years. So, but this is a format, and you have to say something within the eight minutes, and you have a limitations of, a slight limitations also there. So, you better, you better start. You can see the logo and the whole idea of crack is coming from, which is very local knowledge uh, by epistemology, whatever you say, 
It's called Baul philosophy. Do you have a, some of you? Have, no, I, I think you know the what is called Baul. It's a one kind of Sufi sect from Bengal, and uh, this, and uh, it's a one kind of life practice. It's not art practice. It's life practice. So I'm talking about life practice and how art is a very integral part of life practice. So don't think he is for doing some performance or something. This is his everyday life practice. So next. And this is what they said at Shadhu Shang. Shadhu Shang is actually a place where people of people from the same like-minded people or especially the followers of the Baul saints or Baul masters, they get together for a few days, stay together, they share their ideas and views and they live. And I found uh, when I was just passed out from the art institute and I was I was looking for something something which is not you know this land this uh, this whole South Asian countries are living in a colonial hangover you know so we are looking for something which is out of the this colonial hangover is that any way because it, there must be something which is pre-colonial is that still existing that was our Coest actually, and we found this different kind of subaltern religious groups and their life practices set different. And this is Shadu Shango and what they did, and I found that they don't want any corporate support for that. They can arrange it by themselves. So I found at the same time in the urban practice is that you need to go to some corporate support or some kind of you know, some elite support to organize art camp or some kind of workshop, but they don't need it. So if they can do it, then why don't we? So we decided we better start to try to do something. And and next slide, please. And this is our the place. What we have been at we have been organizing this camp for the last 10 years. So at the time I met a guy whose, whose name is Delwar Hussein, I should say. He's an, he is an, a non-academic artist. And he left, he was involved in the art practice in the 70s and he left it. And he became a farmer. So this land is be belong to him, and I met him when I was doing a research on art, uh, local art history. I am from a small town. It's called Kushtia. So this place is also the part of Kushtia, very near to the town, not in the village, just outskirts of the town. Okay, next slide. And this is, you see, that this is the artwork from the first art camp. We showed, we call it Polash with his girlfriend. So. Because we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't make our logo at first. We did the whole art camp first. So I decided, okay, we can create the logo with this thing. So our, the track is like that. Next slide. So it, it is just from the second art camp in 2008, we decided to, we are bored with the, showing our work to the human being. We decided to create an project which is exhibition for fishes. So we thought, okay, man, just create some work and float in the pond and better fishes can see the work. Next. And you can see the local audience, no urban people, local people. So they can try to understand what they're doing. This is a, a, a small part of artwork by Joya Shahin Hawk, who is now teacher in the print making department in Faculty of Fine Arts. She's also from Kushtia. Next. These are the children, so the local children. They are an integral part of the camp. So they are also part of the camp, and they also help the, all the artists and creative people. Next. And what they did, you see. They don't need anything very expensive material. They can create their artwork. They can explore their uh, creativity with the leaves and everything. You see, this is the, one of the things. Next. And for this is also, you see, this is the reward of Dayhan Ahmed Rafi. We don't need anything. This is, the, this is one of the basic idea. We don't want any expensive art material for us. So Raihan Abhidrafi created a rickshaw with the leaves and, you know, see, you can, next. Cow by cow dung. <laughs> this is a artwork by Sabir, Sheikh Sabir, who is now studying in Norway. He is also from Kushtia and very integral part of the crack. He did it. So, you see, next. It's with buffalo horn. And in some ardent port. The Ashim Halda Shagur's work, one of the nice examples, I think. And he cannot bring it. And I can tell you. 
You cannot sell it also. This is completely non-commercial. We don't take money to anyone, and we don't give, give money to anyone. There's no commercial business. Next. And this is a performance, very site-specific and time-specific performance by Abu Nasser Robi. And you see what he used the sunset. How? This is very interesting. Next. And this is another work by Shatadru Shavan from India. At the time, he, he was trying to do something with local materials, and the concept was unconscious and not input kind of thing. Next. Uh, this is another work, very site-specific. Uh, work by Tapoti Choudhury from Kolkata, who was the, she was the last uh, curator of the last edition of the CAN. And she did it, with, it's a one kind of, I forgot the title of the uh, work, but it's a boat and made by local materials. Hmm. Oh, I forgot to see my time. Let's, let's see. Two or three? Oh, that's fine, enough. Next, please, please, carry on. And this is what we do, not like this, like that. On the under the blanket, very informally. But this is our only formal thing, what we did, you know? Otherwise, we have very informal adda all the day, all the time. You can see the next, next slide. This is the original adda, you know? With a lot of music and bowel people around there, a lot of music, a lot of many things I shouldn't say here. <laughs> uh, no, this is a very gentle audience. Please, get on. And this is the last scene, last cup of tea together. The bus is ready, car is going to the border, and some people are going back to Dhaka. And you see what's happened. The artists from five or six countries together, and you see the faces of the people. All are happy, because we believe in the happiness. Thank you. Uh, based on our village, so today, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit. OK, this is also part of my project. So most of my project is uh, based on the, the community. So I used to work with the, the villagers and the local people. So as you know about the Myanmar, so we are living in a very difficult situation, so long time. So that's why so I, I don't need to talk a lot about the, the country situation. So artists are also, we are working like this kind of the situation. So that's why um, I do like this kind of the work. So uh, Maybe if you don't mind me, so can I re request you everyone so to participate with me? So one minute. Okay, can you can you stand up? Together? Oh, together. Yeah. Okay, please do like me. <laughs> so, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so okay, we, yeah, okay. So this is also my 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 project. So I do like this kind of the raw material, and, and I work in the village area with the local craftsmanship. So they they work with me. So I I give to them. So like a salary and something like this. So mostly, uh, I come from the village. My village is uh, very far from the uh, city. So tell how I drive by bus Yangon to our village. So until 2011, no electricity, no telephone, no hospital, no police station, nothing. <laughs> so finally, I became an artist, and I, I, can, I can do so many things, and then I, I travel a lot. So right now also, I, I came here, and I talk about this. After this, I will go back to my village, and I will talk about this, this event to the villager, so especially for the, for the, the children. So next slide. So this is also based on the, our our village tradition at first river, and then I do uh, I did this work in the Fukuoka Trinity in two thousand uh, two thousand nine. So uh, next. So this is also my solo project. Everything is based on the the village life. So my project is based on the our own uh, budget. So I never applied to get any foundation grant. So because this. If I apply to, to for the grant, if they cannot pay me, I will I will be upset and I will be something. So so that's why I never apply. I don't want to do anything. So that's why. So okay, you can ask me how uncle can you can you get the, the budget from your project? Okay, I do so many painting, but I don't want to do the painting. I really don't like to do, but no try to get the money. So that's why I do so many painting. So. My friend from the villager, so one day asking me, so uncle, what, what is your, 
uh, what is your main idea? So I said, my idea is uh, to do the, like a community, big community project and to make a, uh, like a different kind of the thing, not only the painting. So that's why I always used to say to the joke to my friend. So I am the art prostitute. <laughs> so something like that. So okay, make nice. So this is also uh, my, one of my, my ongoing project. So I started working in the 2008 and so until now I, I stay working. So in the village area, so last 20 over years ago, so in the village, Bainsky is a very expensive. So that's why people cannot use so many. So in the village, around only three Bainsky. So if you have only one Bainsky, you are the real rich person. So, so nowadays, so Bainsky is uh, not so many used. So most of the people, they use the, the motors, motorcycle from the China. So very cheap. They sell the car and they buy the motorcycle. So that's why they throw the, their, their own bicycle. So that's why I collect that kind of the, the bicycle part and I remake the new thing. And then, so we, 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 all, we all went all together around the village area and then, so I made the, the photograph uh, each place every year. So now you can see that kind of the landscape in the photograph. In the real situation, you cannot see anymore. Because our, our village is uh, between the, the very big river and very big uh, stream. So that's why the shape is uh, like, uh, like this. So nowadays, so the village landscape is uh, the slide, slide down to the river every year. So that's why our village is uh, now like a samosa. So, <laughs> so, so maybe next. So this, you can see this kind of the images. So he's from the, the, the our village area. He's an old soldier. So he, he have no legs. He broken everything. So he cannot walk. So, but he, he, yeah, he opened the, the Bainsky repair shop. And then, so I'm working with that kind of the person. So this is my project. So that's why, so my Bainsky is a big thing because of him. So, okay, nice. So this kind of this, uh, I start working this kind of the, my project in 2007. So 2007, 2009, 2011, 2012, and 2013. So really recently I I done the, the five year for the, my village project. So if I have a money, so I will I will carry on. Uh, I will do again for the village project. If I do not have the money, so I will stop. So and then I collect, I save money, and I will do it again. So okay. Thank you very much. So we have no time to. Comrades, in the sense that we are all coming from off center, though I don't know what is uh, said or off center, because as I have seen all those uh, shows, all those, um, um, all those lectures, and I found that, okay, everybody is doing so great. And actually, it's, it doesn't matter where we are actually um, staying. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, um, uh, uh, Samdani Art Foundation for inviting Jog to this beautiful panel discussion about art initi initiatives of the center. I would really love to tell you the story of our journey toward a new way of art practice and introduce our space, which is based in Chidomang. Basically, we are an interdisciplinary art organization who focuses on the participation of mass population or public in art activity. We also consider Jog as a platform to give priority to very young artists to open up themselves into a more free, non-conventional art practices. Jog means plus. We want to add something to the arts practice and to the artist or to the society, or to the community, or to the public sphere, art people, to add something to everything. We have started our journey in 2012, when two of our students, two teachers and an artist, we were gossiping about art after experiencing the first Dhaka Art Summit, Asian Art Biennale, and art and art, um, other contemporary shows happened on that time. Many questions arise from that Adda. Uh, why we are considered consider an exhibition successful if we see works uh, listed 200 known faces visited the shows in Chidagang? How about rethinking the fact that 
whether the works are attracting or communicating with the viewers? If not, why? What should be the interrelationship between the artworks, art people, and public? Are we content about the curriculum and pedagogy of finest institutions, etc.? We were discussing a lot. From that, at the Joke Art Space was born. Our core members include Jayad Ali Choudhury, Shaila Sharmin, that's me, Jian Kodim, and Syed Mohammad Sorab Jahan. Within a month, we initiated to start with a street event as an experiment to challenge ourselves. Chiragi Lane was our choice as it is a meeting place for young and intellectual people from diverse disciplines. They gathered there in the evening to have chat with each other and drink tea. So we thought that, okay, let's go for them. Chiragi also has many newspaper companies, garments, printing presses there. The historical significance of the Mughal background and the mythical story of Bart of Chittagong on Chiragi by Badr Shapir and his lab has instigated us to strive a new specific art show there. Chiragi art show one raised questions, confusions, rejection, interest, appreciation, publicity, and expected communication among art people and public. The performances, video art installations, interactive artworks, murals were such sensitive incorporated historical, architectural, sociopolitical, environmental features of the place and the alternative discourses of urban everyday life and its dealers and paid strong attention on locality. The positive responses and interest and gathering of huge viewers inspired us to run the show and well it. And we're doing it till now. Since CAS1, we have done four uh, editions of Chiragi Art Show within four years till 2011. Uh, I would like to, uh, you to uh, see the slides. Uh, the, the C we call Chiragi Art Shows, uh, sites, uh, CAS, and we have done CS1, 2, 3, and 4. And um, uh, we have some formations as we, I, I'm going to uh, talk about, but first let me, do, uh, let me show this one. Um, the most important thing was for us the public interventions and public reactions and and this street shows actually shows us those things and we are proud that thousands of people are come here and and all of them comes from very diverse disciplines like and very diverse classes and and other uh, and those people especially who actually don't go to the cubic spaces to see the art exhibitions or they never actually get any chances to see uh, any kind of art exhibitions and we thought that okay we will go to those people who actually never witnessed any kind of art exhibitions and what happened if we if we just uh, go with the artworks the what we call it, uh, high high art we, uh, the educational institutes are uh, doing and uh, if we go with that art to the straight to the street what will happen how they are going to receive it it was our uh, main focus and believe me it was like a surprise for us that the people around uh, the commoners the common people who never saw any kind of art works they were actually uh, rela uh, making relationship really properly and they were trying to understand what we are actually talking about, what we are showing it. Sometimes it was really ridiculous for them to see a video artwork because they, these people, they actually uh, are really used to with televisions as, uh, and also they, uh, they uh, only sh can see uh, for videos, cinemas or uh, the serials and the television, they are used to that things. But when they went to see the uh, interactive artworks and videos, I think they were actually started uh, reacting with them and, and the communications, the, the questions we were talking about and the, then the th thinking we were projecting on those, uh, the ideas we were projecting on those artworks, they were receiving it properly. So without any art educations, how they are actually receiving it. It was a wonder for us. And for that reason, we thought that, okay, we, we will to continue. 
And since CAS1 um, in 2012, we have done four editions of Chiarigi Art Show within four years till 2005. We have decided to curate the show by one of the core members each year by rotation, and we are doing it. Uh, the first show was curated by Jayadali Jodri. And next, next slide, please. We can go on. Besides, uh, you can, we you just go on for this. This is the uh, CAS2 site. It was been to uh, be a very site-specific art show. And for the curation, we have done four lectures uh, based on historical, archaeological, uh, sorry, anthropological and uh, architectural and representational themes. Some four um, persons, personality, art personality, they uh, delivered lecture to the artists, uh, and they, they did, and uh, the process was like uh, how to communicate, uh, how to uh, um, become more communicative with mass population, and how to reach their ideas or their dreams, or how to reach, uh, how to make uh, their reactions proper, properly done in their artworks. Those kind of things were actually uh, working in my mind when I was the curator of that show. And when I, it was really uh, amazing when I found one, one of the rickshaw puller or one uh, uh, like uh, shopkeepers were there, the local shopkeepers and other garments, there are garments workers over there, the, the female garments workers, they were coming in here and, and and they were asking why, wh what is that man is doing inside. It was a performance art by uh, some poet and he was sleeping there for the whole day and he was watching television and he, in that very spot people really uh, 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 sleep it, at night. So the people, the people who sleep at night, they were also actually uh, uh, trying to communicate with that, and they were asking questions why he's what, and they were also thinking, okay, I, if I can w get one television like that, as I am also sleeping here, that kind of uh, questions and that kind of conversations we can hear, we we heard from those people, and also here the artist was uh, drawing, uh, and he was drawing some, um, he was uh, uh, drawing over some nude over some nude figures, he was giving some uh, dresses and he was painting there and the people, they were really getting, I mean, uh, they were really looking at that and they were really, really uh, feeling amazing, uh, I mean, amazed about what is going on. And, and the main thing, we, uh, because we went there, it was that people should communicate with us and ask questions and believe me, it was happening over there each time we did our shows. The next one, please. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the next one is CS3, a non-specific art show. It was based on the artist's work. And um, each year we try to select a different kind of uh, uh, themes for the, because the venue is now settled in a specific place. So it was non-specific, not site-specific. Site and afterwards, CS4, please. It was... Uh, unfold. Uh, curator was Jihan Korim, and he was, uh, he, and the artist was supposed to show their processes to the viewers, and uh, and the viewers are supposed to ask how the uh, the artists are actually making their artworks, and how uh, what what they are telling, and 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 we were actually we are focusing, and we asked we asked the, the curator asked the artist to bring their works uh, uh, and do that on the spot so, the, so that the, the uh, public can actually see how the art, artwork uh, was, can be made. Um, okay, so besides Jayagi Art Show, which is, we are doing uh, annually, Jay, uh, we have monthly lectures, artist talks, presentations, art related film screening, uh, of invited persons from home and abroad. To begin a uh, different pedagogy, apart from the regular art school, we started to initiate workshop-based projects done by very young people of diverse disciplines. Um, uh, Job initiates exchange programs and residency programs each year. We already had young uh, energetic artists from Japan, Taiwan, France, and also from home to make communication with other art spaces, artists, creative uh, practitioners internationally with local artists, students, and 
the public. We are actually doing these residence programs and workshops, and also we uh, like this uh, uh, to uh, the residence artists and other persons who comes where uh, to go to public and uh, work with them. So our main focus is to just to work with uh, mass population. Um, we are facing some problems uh, while we are working with the people and uh, as we are uh, want to do specific, specifically street shows and outdoor shows. Um, there is problem with the training of the artists uh, in the art institutes. Um, and, um, and we are thinking that uh, as uh, our yoga art space is really uh, uh, self-funding art organizations. So we are thinking that maybe is it possible to uh, institutionalize the practices individually and uh, collaboratively we are doing the art spaces of, in small peripheries or in the center, the small art spaces are doing. Maybe there should be a one um, uh, training art schools or uh, institutions in home and abroad and we have a dream that maybe there would be uh, that kind of institution is possible and but yes uh, somehow we are we will uh, hope that we will initiate next so thinking beyond the center establish our system to reflect everyday life to become passionate to the free expression of art and ignore censorship of the capital and society, we hope our journey towards positivity would lead our art leadership to create new avenues in the world of art. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I don't know if we formally still have some time left. I was told that um, 6.30 is curfew. Do we have Yes, five, what, ten, ten minutes? Ten minutes, oh God. Um, okay, so we'll do ten to fifteen minutes. Um, so thank you all. I think what was really impressing, uh, impressive for me is to see in, in, in all your presentations this, really, this desire to create collectivities. And I think that um, in a way came out extremely strongly in the, in the searching various formats and trying and finding sort of the ways which suit your obviously personal um, trajectories, but also the situations in which you work. Various formats, as we've heard, that go from um, the archival to the performative uh, to sort of this, this idea of the continuous exhibition that stays as a center um, of visitation, but also this question of creating a public, yeah? a public in a place where there is no obvious public, a public that actually doesn't know itself as being a public. So how do you do that? I think another point that, is, is, that comes kind of with this question of the public is also finding a language. You know, how do you speak? How do you speak back? In which way can you actually engage uh, any form of artistic practice um, and you know how does how does um, language play a role in all of that and of course with language comes body clearly um, but maybe one question I would just quickly like to ask is um, we very little heard about uh, the political nor the realm of conflict it, was mentioned as maybe an, a, a, an implicit sub-line of uh, some of your presentations, but um, I'd be really curious to bring that up. Um, I think most of the topics, most of the places that we have looked at and heard about have, as almost all places today, I need to say, have incre increasingly uh, torn world histories and recent histories and um, in what way is a certain form of depolitization of practice and discourse something that you would agree on or has it just not come up because um, eight minutes is too short to talk about everything? Would anyone care to maybe address that question? Um. 
<laughs> well, the deep politics, I, I, I found that every, every presentation was, um, you know, very much going into presenting various platforms and tools and so on, but it was actually quite unpolitical in a certain way, yeah? I mean, even 10 years ago, I would say the political with big P, you know, would have come first, issues of conflict and so on. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, that's uh, perhaps because it's too complicated to discuss the politics of the situation within eight minutes. Uh, there are too many things happening. The more you look at it, there are too many strands. All of us are, I think everybody is speaking from extremely complicated uh, territories, physically, politically, socially, and so on. So to map that, is, uh, you know, you, you, I think everybody has just skipped that and just gone straight to give some illustrations of what they're doing. So it's, it's not depoliticizing the discourse. It's just, uh, I think, being a bit efficient uh, within the time period. I, I think if each of these people had uh, 40 minutes, half an hour, uh, then they would probably speak about how people live around them and what are they going through and what do they feel and so on and how do they respond so that's what i'd say any comments on that yeah yeah just one second just for instance after her presentation i did think i mean it's so complicated to work so difficult to work in assam or in the northeast and i know that she didn't mention even give an indication of how crazy it is uh, but I mean, you could lose your life as well, you know. So it's you in in that. I'm not. I'm saying that. Uh, I'm not saying that their their lives are in danger. But uh, you need to think before you move. Uh, so. Yeah. So I think um, you know what Amar said is perfectly uh, valid. And uh, uh, the one thing that uh, you know working in these contexts uh, does is, of course, uh, you are working in very political context, but also I think there is a balancing act as artists or, you know, you know, when you're working between this position that is between activist and artist, there is also, you don't want to just get reduced to the role of uh, being the, you know, spokesperson for a certain politics. And you want to emphasize the form and, you know, your uh, art practice as well. So I think that is a balancing act that we all have to kind of tread very carefully, but you then also have strategies to counter that. So we had a Bangladeshi photographer who had made a very political work there and, uh, you know, uh, the Bangladeshi problem in Assam is huge and there's a lot of xenophobia around it. And uh, so in the final presentation, we just asked her not to show any of the work because otherwise it would jeopardize the project. Yeah, I think the, the non-political is also maybe the non-totalizing, you know, which I think is, is, is very interesting. Uh, we tend to think in very totalizing concepts and fragmentation is m maybe much more interesting and, and, and worthwhile. Um, and this possibility to detotalize, um, maybe even just more sort of a very sp a small space, uh, is, um, is actually one of the great potentials, I think, and there's also a certain sense of um, independence that it you know, gives you on a certain level. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? The audience is walking out. <laughs> Nobody is interested in art initiatives of the center. No? Any comments? <laughs> Freezing cold. Uh, OK. I'm just, uh, I'll just speak loudly. Costs. And then the whole question comes about 
finding sponsors. Everyone goes and says to me, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you could get a toothpaste brand or it, you know, it kind of comes down to that level. So it will, the whole idea will be like a Chavan Prash Dharamshah International Festival or, you know, one of these. So I think that's really difficult <clears throat> because we're thinking about, uh, you know, working in the community which people don't understand. So if I go to the local government and I say we need money, they say, uh, but what use is this? Is it good for tourism? That is the only thing they understand is, is it good for tourism? <laughs> uh, they don't understand. I keep saying, no, but it's really good for the community. Can you imagine all these young people in this area are all leaving because there's nothing to do here? They don't just leave for jobs. If this was a more interesting place to live, maybe more people would stay in smaller towns. Uh, but that understanding isn't there. So that's difficult. And then you go to... In my case, uh, when we go to industry, that doesn't work because we are living in a small town. So where's the market? So they say, if you were in Delhi or Bombay, we'd give you funding, but where's the market? Like, who do we reach? So that doesn't work either. So it, it's a constant struggle. Um, but I guess, you know, we decided to start this endeavor, and so we're not allowed to complain about it too much. <laughs> Is it working? No, it's okay. So, what she said just like now about market and local community and the local management, and I just want to ask the, the artists and creative people that. In, in different way actually. So what are you doing? Are you creating some artworks for the elites and some one day some collectors will come and collect it and collect it in the museum? That is very important. Don't uh, blame all the time to the corporates or politicians and bureaucrats. So what we're doing, the artists and the, all the creative people who are expecting some fund and everything, and now we are trying to say something about politics. Do you think that some other people will come and give you money and you will do some revolution, revolutionary artwork with their money? Is that possible? So my question is, why you are creating art? That is very important for the artist. Are you, do you think that you are creating art for the local people? Do you think that, do you, are you creating art for the elites? If you do it for the elites, I don't mind. Because I know the know that all over the world, there is a court artist and everything. And it's still going on. So I don't mind, this is also going on. <clears throat> but question is, if you want to say about off the center, if you want to say about the politics, the non-political thing kind of thing. So I think it's better to think ourselves why you are trying to do this kind of thing. And is that any way out to do practice your artworks without the support from the corporates or government or everything? So you can think about it. Because last nine years we have been organizing an international art camp in a very small town and we are not taking any money from any corporates and we never applied for a fund. It's going on and very simply. We don't have any fund but we are not afraid. Because we know it will happen. Because a team, of, a, because of local people, the team, they believe that they want to do it. And do you know the local people, how they react to the art camp? They don't understand art camp because what, what does it mean by art camp for the local people? Because that is a small town. So they put a name for it. It's called Mela in Bengali. It's, it's made fair. So that is very important. We like the term. They don't understand art camp because who is the educated people, the privileged people are put the name as art camp. But they put it, oh, this is a yearly fair. At the end of the, end of the December, the people will come from different parts of the world and do, they will do, create some artworks. And people will try to understand what they're doing, some madman. And even one of my drivers told me, I never saw some madman came together and staying, to everything, staying together and doing everything very, very naturally. It's the first time I saw. You see? They have their own knowledge also. Do you think that they have knowledge, or do you think that we need to educate them? That is a very important question for me. Thank you. I, I, I have a question um, to you regarding your comment, but also regarding uh, this relationship to Baal music. Um, are you deliberately using these formats in order to, are, are you connecting with Baal music and the Mela and so on? actually to be closer to a community? Is this, uh, you know, is this spiritual, for instance, is the way to describe what you do uh, part of connecting better? 
Actually, I, it was very difficult for me to explain everything in, the, in eight minutes, but now I can tell you something a little bit more here, because, <laughs> <laughs> because what I was telling that, that thing is that if you want to see everything from the, in, the, in the same window, what we see in the, in the Indian subcontinent, the whole education system, art education system is based on the colonial education system, and it's still practicing. And you know, so, but I was looking for, and some my colleagues also was looking for something which is pre-colonial. And this is the matter of knowledge and epistemology. So if you find something which is pre-colonial, and if it is connected with art, then what happened? So they have some, there. for example, that Baul people, that the Baul practices have been here for a long time. And this is a very connected with the uh, earliest example of Bangla literature, it's called Shorjapur. And it has a very strong connection with Buddhism and Vaishnavism, even the Sufi sects. So Baul is a specific, specific kind of practice. They have specific knowledge and it has some universality also. I don't think that this is a Baul, it's, it's a matter of Kushtia only. Don't think like that. Because for me, sometimes it is also important that what does it mean by international art? Do you know? I don't understand actually. Because I know a villagers cannot understand the Picasso or Guernica. It's true. It's for sure. But even if it has happened in the, in the, in the Europe, if, if you put some local, local art from Bangladesh or Africa or something, it's said, oh, it's a folk art. It's going on everywhere, and it's this, this is a, it's a very complicated thing. It's a, connected with politics and power and colony and everything. So it is very difficult to explain everything here in this audience, but I should say what we are trying to do in crack, trying to find some oil, which is not no, very... Not, not everyone in Europe thinks it's folk art. Yeah. Not everyone. No, no. <laughs> sometimes I believe that everyone is folk art, actually, you know. If it is a really good art. <laughs> People like it, that's why it's folk art, isn't it? So I'm Ilifakchaman, so sorry to interrupt your uh, speech. I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, but I'm a little confused about uh, what is folk art and what is craft, because craft is, uh, for me as an artist, I thought, uh, they, uh, they make so many things for uh, uh, some people, for sometimes people thought it's for living, for for daily life, for for uh, many purposes. But uh, they are real artists. I I, I thought as a Risha art, it's uh, they are mobile for. But uh, if you deeply uh, think about that, what is the uh, difference between artist and that uh, craftsman? Is there a, I have a question? Do you understand? Um, what is the difference between artists and uh, the uh, I can tell you very simply, this is the modernist point of view. Clear? Pardon? So if you, want, if you want to see everything in the modernist point of view, you can find some difference between the fine arts, folk arts, artists, craftsmen, everything. It's a very academic thing. We need to solve this thing and uh, there's a lot of doubt about it which is actually folk art and what should, is it the only way to put a tag, a label on the folk art kind of thing or what is the issue? It is a very complicated thing and this is, audience is not uh, the, actually I think this is the right place to discuss and make a decision right now. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe, uh, maybe discrimination. <laughs> it, can, it can be, it is very connected to the colonial knowledge I said, I should say. Uh -huh. well, always because uh, because uh, because it's practicing in, in this kind of knowledge is practicing here. For example, uh, for example, what can I say? So, if you want to put some difference, you can do this. I don't mind. But some people can do it that I don't want to make any difference. I think that, for example, I saw some journal evidence, famous painting. Uh, in, the, in the other another form, like with terracotta, 
and it's a struggle. Some boy, some guys pulling some cart, huh? and you know, it's this time is very very famous painting. But it became a, a another form of folk art. It's, it's now a terracotta thing, and it's very available in every interface. So. I'm a little, I'm, I'm a little confused actually, and I have a strong doubt actually, I should say. So, and I asked the question actually uh, to the audience in this, in, in this forum like that. So, if you want to create artworks for the mass people, so then you are a folk artist. And if you want to create uh, artwork for the for the museums only or for the elite person only, so you maybe find some other term for it. It depends on you or any artist. Anyone can do it. So even the, in the academy or even the art historians can put some labels sometimes. Because I have been studying folk art for the last 15 years. I never found anyone who claimed himself or herself as a folk artist in Bangladesh and in, even in India, even in Nepal. I never found anyone say, claim himself, I'm a folk artist. He said, I'm an artist. In Bengali, it's called, I do it. And this is artwork I usually do. So this term, folk art, is also labeled by the privileged and educational educated people. So think about it, please. I mean, this, this notion of artist has become even more complicated as uh, cooks consider themselves artists and DJs consider themselves artists and so on. So it's not just going back about this old distinction between folk art and yeah. we have now new distinctions you yeah. know that have come up with yeah. newer economies yeah. where suddenly the, the, this uh, claim over the territory of art has become you know, sort of a more size so now now you have to battle with your chef right um over who is the real artist um so i think you want us to finish most likely uh, final question to my co-panelists. Anyone, you hold the microphone. Maybe it seems there's an urgent desire, which we can, of course. Um, no, I'm just thinking about the, quest, the comment that you made, Daniela, about seeing what we are all doing as being non-political. Um, and I think, of course, if you had had more time and with that, like, you know, we could have elaborated about the context in which we work a lot more, but I think that's also a question that comes from the center to, to the periphery. And I, and I think as well, you know, um, what tentative collective do at the risk of so much in the public domain in, in Karachi is work that, um, I would never describe as non-political. Um, the archive is in a city that's under um, army control. Um, again, I mean, it's an everyday, it's what you deal with. Um, you don't, it's not, an, it's not a style in the way that I think politics can sometimes be talked about. I mean, just, I wanted just to say that um, it's, of course, not time to do always these longer, more calibrated kinds of reflections on everything that we all do and the diversity of what this panel also brings to practice and practice practices in different kinds of locations. But I felt I wanted to just make that comment. No, thank you. And uh, what I was comment, I, I know a lot of practices quite intimately and I know how political they are. Yeah? There is no doubt about it. I was just commenting on the fact that we actually heard in the one hour, one and a half hour. Very little commentary about it. You know, very, that sort of seemed to be backgrounded. And that's why my question was, is that just because eight minutes are eight minutes? Or is it um, because maybe urgencies are different? Yeah, sometimes that could also be the answer. You know, it's like yes, we are working in an incredibly politicized environment, but actually we decided that our urgencies are here and now, and they actually leave the political out. Yeah, that can be an answer. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not um, giving. I was just posing the question to hear you out. You know. Um, I know, you know, a panel like that 10 years ago would have mainly brought up issues of the post-colonial, being at the border, you know, being political. 
this I have experienced. So uh, there was just a different type of tonality in here, which, yes. Yes. Might need a moment, maybe give it a chance, a second try. No. So the word that kept popping into my head uh, very often was native informant. And I think that's also a little bit to do with, uh, it's not just eight minutes, I think actually they, it was very good because you were all absolved of having to become nat native informants. Have you had, you had more time? There would be that added pressure too, which ties to what Sham Charmi was saying, this expectation that uh, coming from certain areas, one has to feel obliged to talk about politics in certain ways. So I think, as you said, 10 years ago, this wouldn't have been in, this, in these shades and hues. I think it's also partly because people have become much more sensitive and uh, acutely sensitive in a way to this uh, position of the native informer, who is and who is one speaking to. And of course, the subaltern can speak, but who is listening? So that's also important. So I think that's why also one then doesn't feel obliged. Thank you. Can I just add another thing that's happening is that after working for three, four to five to 10 years, a lot of our practices have moved past that point of announcing that this is political and the language of the work itself <coughs> develops to a point where that is, that is where the politics are. So the second question about money, I think that plays a very big, very important role also in how the politics of surviving in this system which does not support or value art production becomes a way in which you make art. And so your medium changes, the way you perform art, the way the places you show art, the houses you convert to make into art spaces, or the shacks, or, or whatever, all of that transforms as a result of this very complex relationship of money and power. And I feel like it's an amazing thing that we're not actually saying that it's political, because it just it doesn't need to be said anymore. Yeah, I just want to add one small thing. I found it really interesting how you know, adding to what everyone's been saying, that, uh, you know, a lot of people had maps, and that itself was very interesting for me because that said a lot. So the geography and, you know, the politics is so closely connected. And uh, also, I think, uh, you know, the way, um, you know, he just mentioned that, you know, Myanmar and, you know, you know what's been going on there. I think, yeah, it's again about, you know, you're supposed to know these things rather than, again, taking the position of the native informant. Thank you. Yeah, it was just a comment, excuse me. It's about uh, the point is that you don't just consider the artwork as the final expression, but just a tool, as many other things can be, to create a larger cultural action. I think that this is the guideline that has to be followed. Thank you.